First of all, uh, Natalie uh, Molina Nino, who um, is co-founder and chief strategy officer at Known Holdings, um, but also um, wrote a book called Leapfrog, The New Revolution for Women Entrepreneurs, which apparently by the book authority was described as one of the best CEO books of all time. So um, as a fellow author, I'm kind of jealous of you already, but uh, <laughs> fantastic, congratulations. Then I bring up um, Santiago Alvarez, uh, who is a co-founder and managing partner at Alive Ventures, based in Bogota. And uh, last, by no means least, Eliza Rodi, who has recently joined the Sorensen uh, Institute to oversee the impact investing work there, but was previously running the US investment portfolio of yeah, yeah, Acumen Fund, which I think was one of the first um, <laughs> funds that ever got me really to understand the role of um, yeah. <laughs> uh, impact investing that's done as an impact first, but a long-term investment strategy and breaking all the rules of capitalism as it then seemed to be uh, when they started. So um, Krupa mentioned, uh, as we start off, the, the, the Social Progress Index, which I helped co-found. And it's, I just wanted to make a, a little uh, plug for something we've just done for anyone that's interested in community and economic development, which is Social Progress Index measures um, using 12 different um, components uh, that are outcomes for a place so ranging from things like do you have basic health care and water and through to access to higher education and the right to marry who you want or to um, you know, practice the religion you want and so forth. Thanks to um, MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, we have now just rolled out uh, the Social Progress Index to every zip code in the United States, mm -hmm. which we believe can allow you to compare your little community uh, down to that level with any other community in the country and theory focus on the US and see how your community performs on, on those outcome measures, which I think when you look at places with similar income per head, you know, could open up a quite revolutionary conversation about why is your community doing better or worse than very similar communities across the country. So I do encourage you to have a look at that, that data because I think moving to a much more data-driven uh, framework around performance of communities for their people is one thing that needs to happen. I, would, I wish I'd known we were having this conversation because I would have tried to have a panel here at, at, at this conference to talk about it in more detail. But what we are doing with this panel is bringing together three members of our curation uh, group that are part of an effort at SOCAP to bring more minds together to help make sure the program is exactly addressing the, the key questions that need to be addressed right now by this community. And the three panelists are all, have all been part of that curation. And so one thing we're gonna be doing in this session is really talking about the thinking behind the choice of panels that is gonna unfold over the next uh, day or two on this track. And um, I guess also a discussion of which panels, you know, you wish you'd been able to pull off but weren't able to, but also which ones you really are excited about uh, to give you a sense of you know, maybe how to plan your program over the next day or two. But also I want to at the same time uh, get some insights as to how the three of you see the world right now, um, what you're wrestling with in your own work, um, and, and, and the sort of questions you're, you're hoping are gonna be addressed uh, over the next day or two in these panels along this track. So, I'm gonna start straight away with, uh, with Natalie. Just give us, first of all, a bit more about where you're coming from, your work, why, why this topic of community and economic development matters to you. Sure, actually, initially, I think, um, as the tracks were coming together because of my background and also the, the purpose of my company, we invest in um, all sorts of things, but we have a special emphasis and expertise and access into BIPOC-led, BIPOC-led funds, BIPOC-led enterprises. Um, the, the, I think, natural um, direction was putting me into the DEI or, or something, conversation around diversity, but I really wanted to focus on community and economic development because at the end of the day, 
almost related to your index, we know that you know, everyone's life, economic life, you know, happiness, all the other measures is raised um, when a community is, is leveled up. Um, and so uh, where I'm coming from is through that lens. And so if you see a lot of people, um, both because of the policy of SOCAP and because of my access, if you see a lot of indigenous people on our track uh, speaking, if you see indigenous-led revenue-based finance, indigenous-led VC, if you see um, actually there was an impromptu cancellation because somebody got COVID for the reverse uh, Shark Tank one that we're having tomorrow and we replaced them with the first indigenous person to own an investment bank on Wall Street. So these are the things where sometimes excuses get made. It was like, ah, it's a last minute. Sorry, we have a panel of only men or we have a panel of only, you know, we didn't have this group represented. I think that one of the things that, um, if the question is where I'm coming from, is those, those accidents don't happen if I'm here. So Liza, same question to you. Yeah. Um, I think I come from a background that's been, you know, for the last sort of 20 years of this movement of impact investing, been trying to demonstrate the ability to use traditional tools of capitalism for impact. And I think um, as someone who's been involved in that from both the legal side and the investment side, I think we've shown that that is possible. And something I'm grappling with, and I think a lot of people in this room are grappling with, are thinking about, okay, we've, we've done that. What are the shortcomings of using some of those, short, of those traditional tools, particularly in sort of the venture capital context, which is where I'm coming from? Um, with a very heavy impact lens, I was, I was focused on building a, a fund tackling challenges of poverty in the US, um, but using very traditional you know, venture capital tools. And I think at this point in, in my life and in the life of this movement, um, I think there's a lot of curiosity and exploration very much needed around how do, we, how do we get a little bit more creative about the tools we're using and where wealth accrues when businesses that we invest in are successful? How do we make sure that um, we think about sort of every step of that process and um, if, a, if a business is successful, the employees of those businesses should be successful. The community members around that business should, be, should share some of that wealth building opportunity. And so, I think that's where I am coming from right now, um, is really beginning to stretch and, and think creatively about how to use different kinds of tools in this space um, uh, to really enhance the, the ripple effect that occurs um, with investment. And Santiago. Yes, um, so Matthew, I'm, I'm born and raised in Colombia. Um, I, I lived there my, my entire life with the exception of a few years abroad. Um, but. Um, I've been over the last 15 years sort of uh, deeply um, focused on trying sort of to find ways to address the inequality that we live in the region. Um, Latin America is uh, an incredible uh, place, uh, sort of full of opportunities. Uh, you know, if, if you compare sort of the natural resources, uh, even sort of uh, the quality uh, uh, of um, uh, if it's institutions, the population, everything, it's just really poised sort of for success. And still is a region sort of facing enormous, enormous challenges. Um, and, and one of sort of the biggest, the biggest concerns that are, or, or things that, that uh, bother me is, is the inequality gap that we have, uh, which is the biggest of, of uh, across the globe. Um, and therefore, you know, been trying sort of to work and, and spend my time sort of in, in finding sort of uh, uh, business models or solutions sort of that are trying to address that from a, from a scalability and sustainable perspective. Um, but, but also, I guess, in the early days, there was, there was just uh, sort of the um, belief that, you know, it, it was just kind of, kind of um, if you take it an, a, a cautious or conscious sort of investment approach, that, that would be, in general, kind of a silver bullet sort of to provide, you know, well-being to others. And, and actually, you know, 10, 15 years first forward, it is, I mean, I think the general concept uh, prevails, but there is so much more than that, sort of to, be re to really be able sort of to have positive impact uh, in a community and to be able sort of to really sort of address uh, inequality. And um, I think what, what I was excited sort of about this track, sort of when we entered the discussion, is that it is really about sort of doing double click in terms of different approaches sort of to try to solve a specific need or a specific challenge. And so, you know, it's like uh, the, the venture model is not the silver bullet sort of to investing in early stage. 
uh, there are other alternatives. But mezzanine financing is not the silver bullet either, you know, when you think about sort of illiquidity in the region. So really sort of have that kind of thought, thoughtful approach and consideration and analysis to understand what has worked, what hasn't worked, and how we can do it better you going forward is really what uh, sort of uh, I think is, uh, is this, track, uh, this track about. Great. Well, I think the first theme that as you guys met beforehand to uh, sort of c consider what panels to have here, the first theme that you really coalesced around was power dynamics as a, uh, as a huge area in community and economic development. And as I've been thinking about that, you know, I mean, it feels to me that this is the year where power dynamics at almost every level of the world are, are in play in ways that are highly unpredictable. Um, and that if you look at the people I would see as my community in, in, in having been working on impact issues for 15, 20 years or more, um, you know, I think this has been a year where suddenly there's a pincer movement um, coming, you know, from the one side, which is uh, people who politically are very fearful of what they might, the power they might lose if the impact movement succeeds. And on the other side, uh, many of the people that, um, you know, we, we've been trying, people have been trying to uh, you know, advance and empower as part of the impact agenda are taking, taking that message seriously and saying, well, actually, if you're serious about this, give us a lot more power over our own futures and, and that, that would be the best impact you could have. And so there's a lot of trying to navigate both of those themes, and that's the case both at the very community level, but also if you look at the global community where we're seeing you know, really fundamental questions being asked. I was at an event in Kenya uh, two weeks ago where basically the African leaders were saying, well, you know, you guys have had 100 years of, 200 years of industrialization and messed up the climate, well, why, and now you're telling us we can't have our economic growth. Why, you know, why should we do anything uh, that you want to sort of help you out of your, the mess you created? And I mean, obviously, I think that's a very troubling line, although completely justified, but it doesn't help us solve climate change. But I want to ask each of you, like, as you've thought about this power dynamics question, where have we come down in, um, in terms of what's on the agenda for the next couple of days? Now, let's start with you, Santiago. Um, yeah, so, ma Mafia, I think that that's a, you know, very, very complex topic that initially sort of uh, we, we even hesitated sort of to how to address. Uh, but ultimately, um, I think sort of the conclusion is that despite sort of being challenging, let's go, you know, front and center. And so um, one of the, th the, the, the thematics or, or, or discussions that uh, uh, people will find sort of in the different panels um, around this track are around sort of how, you know, you, you shift sort of the power from investor, uh, traditionally, you know, the, the ones sort of owning or deploying the capital, uh, to other ways sort of, of engaging. Um, and, uh, and, and how sort of, uh, you know, you, you can sort of transform or, or rearrange sort of that, that structures of power um, uh, with different investment instruments, uh, sort of with different lenses as, as well in terms of, of, uh, of investing. Um, considering sort of, um, you know, general lens approach, uh, an environmental lens approach. Like when, when you start sort of including filters or lenses sort of into the, into the thesis as well, um, you start sort of changing the dynamics because you start taking into consideration into the investment decision process different aspects of a, of a, of a discussion. So I think that, that's, that's part of, of, of uh, what it's been incorporated as well. Um, and then there are also a couple of div dives in specific uh, models, uh, in Chicago, in, in, in other areas, sort of that that have gone even farther in terms of you know redistributing equity um, and, and therefore power uh, to be able sort of to to to, to try to balance the equation. So um, I think that that's that's um, some of the things that is exciting sort of about about the discussions uh, you will find in the next three days. Natalie, what about you? Where where where, where do you come down on this? Um, agreed on the complex side of it, um, and maybe even some of the tenuous first steps. But I feel strongly um, in, in everything that I do, and I think that with this, our conversation went towards 
what, what does it look like practically, right? What does power dynamic shifting look like practically and where can we see examples? Where can we bring those examples to the table for people to, to witness and to discuss and hash out? And for me, it really came down to ownership, is can we look at power dynamics through the shifting of ownership, right? Um, this, we hear so much about the lack of VC for, for women and people of color. We hear so much about the wage gap. Um, but we really don't hear about the fact that over 98% of the entire world's capital and assets uh, are not controlled by the global majority. So 70% of the world own and control less than 2% of the world's money and assets. That is not a number that we're bandying around a lot. And for me, that number and the immobility of it and the fact that it hasn't changed for, gener for generations, that is the power dynamic. I think you know we have been a little bit distracted by the conversation around representation, not to suggest that representation doesn't matter, but if you are the president of a company, you can be fired. If you are the president of the United States, you can be impeached. There are all these positions of significant representation and power that are really temporary and fickle. And the one position you can't be fired from is, is the owner of something. And I think people of color, in particular the global majority, have to center themselves as owners. And we, as asset allocators and as people who are influential in the space, have to center that as the goal rather than just figureheads. And I think that when you look at the track and you look at the conversations that we've teed up, there's a lot of that happening. And this and there are sessions on indigenous people, and, uh, and there, there's sessions on uh, black lives and the minority community. Or as uh, in the US we call uh, it, new majority. Yeah. yeah, and also women. Absolutely, yeah. always majority. <laughs> yeah. Um, Eliza. Yeah, I mean, I think in that vein, I think, a, I think an awesome panel on this track is the reverse pitch competition, mm -hmm. which Natalie is particularly involved with. I think that's- So this is a kind of dragon's den Great. Backwards. Exactly. A reverse Where you fire the venture tank. capital. Um, and I think it's a, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I, I think that's the wrong TV show, but I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. It's, um, yeah, I think that's a really, I think investors, in order to really live this, these values, need to sort of sit in the, the shoes a bit and, and mm. feel that sensation of, of actually giving power to, um, in a way that they're not accustomed to. Um, the other thing I'll highlight is this speaks to a panel that I'm working with tomorrow on blended finance, but I'm seeing a lot of a lot of projects in this space that are trying to effectively shift power to communities in the design of um, investment structures, of community projects, of large-scale climate projects, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and what's really interesting, I think, is there is an incredible education component of that for the you know, the teams and the communities that are taking that on. Um, was just talking to a project recently that was discussing how they, they literally have to spend a lot of legal dollars um, and time educating federal agencies how to interact with their community through, you know, a process that, is, that exists for, you know, big clean tech energy projects, but they don't know how to interact with, um, you know, a tribal-led corporation of this structure and this type um, and so I think just some really interesting practical elements that we can dive into around, um, you know, the theory and the philosophy and the intentions are great, but there's a lot of field building and education of power holders in order to effectively create opportunity for power transfer. Yeah, I wanted to build on that and ask each of you, you know, in your own work, is there a particular case that you're dealing with now where you feel, you know, you can do something to really accelerate the power shift? Why don't we start, continue? Start with me. <laughs> I think um, the way I see it most directly in my work, um, I am doing early stage investing. I think of it most often just in how I interact with entrepreneurs, the entrepreneurs that I am, um, you know, supporting and cultivating in their journey. How do I establish like a true partnership? I think, like others up here, very focused on um, investing and supporting entrepreneurs who are who are underrepresented in, in the space of entrepreneurship and venture capital and um, and and really presenting myself as a collaborator and a partner in their journey um, is sort of how I live the power sharing in a, on a daily basis um, and then you know projects like the one I referenced is how I'm, I'm seeing it at more of a um, systems level and a, and a sort of project um, project example basis and really learning from those teams about 
about the work that they have to do to, to see progress here. Santiago. Um, we launched Alive uh, back in 2016, and it took us sort of about two years sort of to get off the ground, even. It was, it was a big challenge sort of uh, in terms of fundraising. Um, and our sort of ultimate goal in respect sort of impact, it was sort of to try to, um, you know, support local entrepreneurs that were trying sort of to address inequality gap um, and provide goods and services to level, people living in poverty. Um, but having said that, sort of when we got started very rapidly, we realized sort of that if we didn't take a very cautious um, and uh, conscient sort of uh, gender lens investment approach, it would be very difficult for us to really sort of achieve our ultimate goal in terms of empowering and, 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 and supporting poverty reduction because of the sort of intrinsic dynamics of the Latin American culture. Um, and so, you know, uh, 2018, with the support of organizations, internally, we started uh, um, questioning sort of what, what is sort of the gender inequality in the region within our team. Um, and ultimately, sort of, we ended up sort of incorporating a gender lens approach across our investment appro uh, uh, process, uh, and not only sort of for diligence, but also for supporting the portfolio companies and providing with the technical assistance facility that we have, we were able sort of to partner with a specialist in the field, Value for Women, so that all our portfolio companies uh, benefit. And I'm telling all this long story is because that's really sort of what we're seeing, you know, five, five years fast forward, is that having, ha having made sort of that conscious decision of putting a gender lens, you know, front and center of our processes, and then being explicit about it, is, is creating a change in the terms of the power dynamics of the entrepreneurs in which we invest, in the companies in which we invest, even in the value chains in which we invest, um, just because being explicit uh, and being intentional in terms of um, supporting a, a, a more equitable sort of uh, society. Um, I, I mean, we're starting sort of to see some of those results, uh, clearly early days still, um, but that's something that, that, that um, I think we will continue addressing uh, towards the center. And Natalie, I mean, ownership stuff particularly? Or? Well, yeah, I, you said projects where, where this is more, most manifested. I mean, known is a black, Cherokee, Latinx, and South Asian owned firm. Um, we will never have a chief diversity officer, and we will never have a DEI program. We just are. Um, and I think that some of that has to do with, you know, walking the walk and, and giving people an alternative because what we see is that there are people, whether they be families, whether they be people running large endowments, um, our client Microsoft, people have the intention, they just need to be shown the way. They're not necessarily sure how. And they're being told um, by a lot of the sort of entrenched people in the space that you, you can't go with your endowment and do 100% impact without being irresponsible as a fiduciary. And what we're finding is the opposite is true. What we're finding is that the people that are approaching things from a 100% impact lens, through a gender lens, all the, they're ultimately, they're actually winning on the bottom line as well. And so the idea of reframing it as a charitable act to invest in a way that is good for the planet and the people on it, um, when the bottom line actually tells you that you're really future-proofing your portfolio, you're really investing in a way that is not obsolete or not going to put you in a place where you are going to become obsolete. And so for us, it's about proving out the theories. It's about those practical applications, as you mentioned, um, and embodying not just investing in those practical applications, but being an example, right? Our, our supply chain from our lawyers, from our compliance people, um, our caterers, our photographer, um, the hotels we try to stay in, I mean, like the people who came before us, who built ultimately the infrastructure of the economy of this country, the people we employ look like us too. I think one more question around the power dynamics. Uh, I mean, if I think about impact over, you know, if you went back 10, 15 years, people would say in impact investing, you know, we're, we're an alternative to relying on government. You know, we can do this through private mm -hmm. sector action. And to me, the big change, certainly since the start of COVID, is that people are really saying, well, actually, you can't ignore politics about impact. People need to be very cognizant and 
connected and engaged in the politics. Is that on the agenda of this track, or have we not been able to really do that? Um, I would say with the panel that I'm helping out with tomorrow on blended finance, it's a big piece of the puzzle, and I think in uh, more traditional um, economic development and economic finance circles, blended finance has been a, a you know, a topic of, of discussion for a little bit longer, but the real idea there is how do we how do we leverage some of the big dollars in government um, in t you know, for two reasons. First of all, how do we sort of sh do some piloting to make it less risky and scary for those sorts of dollars to come into the space? And, and secondly, how do we leverage some of those dollars to provide some security in the capital stack so that we can then bring different types of investors alongside? Um, so I think it's definitely a theme in that in that conversation around blended finance structures is no, I hope you are, I hope you come up with an agenda for the World Bank to behave very differently to what they've done in the past with yeah. new leadership they do have new leadership yeah. but I was impressed at some of what I heard at a recent conference I would say that the one thing that I would want to center in anything that we're talking about when we talk about something like blended finance and I do think that you'll see it in some of the conversations this week is that it actually isn't all that different from what has already happened. Google wouldn't exist. Twitter wouldn't. I mean, yeah. what? None of the companies that we rely on for everyday life and that ultimately power the economy, especially the new economy, um, would have existed without the government investment in the technologies that they built um, on top of. So the venture capital community doesn't like to admit that. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. But, that is, but it's there. true. Yeah. Okay. Well, a second big theme that you've you've identified is is place based uh, initiatives, and I think. Those are probably you know, fairly self-contained conversations, but maybe some one of you can just give us a quick flavor of what, um, what we got on the agenda on place-based work. Well, my business partner, uh, Jim Castleberry, is participating in a uh, talk about a MacArthur Project based in Chicago, um, which is going to be compelling. And I think that what maybe for me the most important takeaway with these place-based sort of focus in is just that it isn't only about MacArthur's project in Chicago. It isn't only about Chicago. It's about going really, really deep so that we can then go wide with the understanding that um, you and I had this conversation. You can't McDonald's your way into solutions to problems. You can't come with the same exact template in every little community and expect it to work. And so part of how we do that and we build place-based programs globally that work is by going really deep into one and seeing what worked, what didn't, what makes this place special, and how can we learn from this and then accommodate for the uniqueness of other places. Santiago, do you want to add anything to that? I, I think that, I mean, what is interesting sort of uh, about those discussions, similar sort of to what Nathalie is saying, is that it's the importance sort of, of doing that double click and understand sort of the particularities. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of to be able to, you know, once you go abroad or other places, um, really sort of think multidimensionally and how you can adapt sort of to implement. Um, for example, you know, some of the approaches that a partner organization of ours is doing in Colombia um, um, is really sort of how you are able to work with co-ops, but really providing equity to those co-ops so that they, they, they get sort of the possibility and the abilities of running their own businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and um, you know, understanding sort of the, the, the particularities of that, what has worked, what hasn't worked, is, 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 is really sort of what we're trying, uh, or what we'll be looking forward sort of to those discussions. You know, today I think here in, in, in the space of SOCAP we'll, are, are concentrated sort of in, in or a couple of examples in the U.S., uh, but also looking forward sort of how that can be replicated sort of and, and, and extrapolated to other, other places. Okay, I'm mindful that we're getting close to our time, but the um, third theme, um, for this track is really the innovative finance and the extent to which the tools uh, that, of which we can um, drive community and economic development, you know, from an impact perspective, are proliferating. Um, and I guess you want this track to really explore what these new tools are, or how each what, what the new thinking is on how these tools can be used. Natalie, do you want to talk a bit more about that? This, anyone who knows me knows I can go off on how tired I am of VC, but we invest in VC. It is one asset class of many, but my challenge is that it tends to take up 99.9% .9 of the oxygen. And I think that part of what you'll see, and it's not just in the reverse pitch um, panel that we're having, is there is a lack of education and even awareness, right? There is, I'm starting a company, therefore I must get VC. 
where there's my seven-year-old nephew who, what do you want to be when you grow up? He's <laughs> VC because he's been watching too much Shark Tank. Mm -hmm. I want there to be, and I think that the intention with part of this was this sense of an awareness and an education of the other forms of capital that exist, that are viable, that are becoming more viable every day. Um, and then by meeting some of the players and having them tell you about their funds, about their mechanisms for investing, about how they see the world. Um, I, I am disappointed with even just the idea that, for example, we have a name, Unicorn, for a company that arbitrarily gets valued at a billion dollars by a few VCs. But we don't have a name for when a company gets to a billion dollars in revenue. We don't celebrate them. There isn't an article in the newspaper that says, whoa, this company is now a pick animal you want to pick. <laughs> We don't even have a terminology for what it looks like to build real businesses that are not just arbitrarily defined by one niche, because ultimately VC is a niche. So to me, that was very much the goal, is let's, let's talk about what other forms of capital there are. Let's get familiar with them. Let's get comfortable with them. Let's put faces to names so that we can actually pick up the phone and talk to some of the players. Eliza. Yeah, I think um, fully aligned. I think it was really well said. I, I, as I said at the beginning, I. I come from a more traditional background of doing deals in, in the traditional vein and trying to prove that out as a viable strategy with an impact lens. And I think there's just a lot of opportunity right now to think, to be more creative. And a lot of it comes down to, you know, vision and strategy from funders in the room. Um, and what would be some examples from your, your experience? Of, say again? What would be some examples from your experience? Of different types of... Of how you could be more creative? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think looking at different sort of revenue-based structures for investment securities as opposed to just doing the traditional equity convertible debt, you can look at um, straight debt for certain companies if they have the right underlying economic profile. Um, you know, as Natalie said, not every company is or should be attracting venture capital there. There's a very type, a very small type of company for whom that fits. And I think as investors in this space, um, looking at revenue-based financing, look at employee ownership, look at you know different types of operating debt capital. Um, I think there's a lot that's out there that's still a little bit scary for investors. Um, and I think there's there's plenty of room for further exploration as well. I, I think what is exciting about sort of the discussion is that, I mean, I, I like Natalie's coming in terms, you know, I mean, the VC, uh, there's no, no, no more error, sort of, uh, because it, it kind of grabs everything. Um, but then in the Latin America context, um, where it's a very liquid market, I don't know how familiar you are with it, but then a couple of years back, sort of, there started sort of a discussion that re revenue-based financing or self-liquidating instruments, you, they were the silver bullet, you know, because mm -hmm. it was a solution sort of to provide uh, financing, no dilutive, uh, self-liquidating uh, uh, per the definition, and so it was kind of the um, you know the way forward. But actually, it works only for a very few percentage of the companies uh, that they have stable cash flows, that they don't require future rounds of financing because their business model doesn't doesn't need it. Um, and and so I guess the point we're trying I'm trying to make is how in, the importance of really sort of understanding there are different options, and that the one of the biggest mistakes of the ecosystem is that the business models try to align with the source of funding. When it should be the other completely the, the, the other way around, is the, 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 the source of funding needs to be adapt, needs to adapt and be flexible to provide the right structure to the business and to the underlying sort of asset and cash flow that the companies have. And so I think well, what is exciting is right now we're also much more aware of, of the, 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 there is a, a range of possibilities um, and that, and that the, the importance sort of be careful in terms of making the right match sort of to... You what know, do you think is the biggest action. obstacle to that shift happening? I, I think um, one of the biggest is sort of the ability of capital. Um, um, as Natalie mentioned, you know, the, the, the vast majority of this capital is, is, is high risk capital or considered because of the lack of understanding sort of, of the different segments of marketing in which we operate. And therefore, there is an expectation of high returns and therefore it traditionally falls into the VC bucket. You know, this is VC. But we need to break sort of that barrier. We need to break the barrier that is not everything has to go to sort of to the VC model, which is a very specific model that with a uh, very specific sort of characteristics in terms of how a company should grow and you know later financing rounds and so on. And how 
you know, we need to break that model to address or to, to, so that there is availability of the other pools of capital to fund other instruments, sort of the ones that Elijah was mentioning in terms of RBFs for those that can uh, work, or even debt, you know, for those that they would only survive sort of to debt. And so just, just that, that um, um, have that possibility of funding, uh, I think is the big, biggest obstacle sort of to overcome. Okay, well, we're almost out of time, and um, I'm going to ask each of the panelists uh, to, to give us a two, two one-sentence answers. One is, um, you know, which question, what's the question that you, as you go to these events over the next couple of days on this track, are you most looking, most, most desirous of finding an answer to or having your thinking really move forward? The other is, is there one panel that you would recommend above any other that the audience here should go along to? And, I, and as you think about the answers, I'd just like to say, I think this has been a very full conversation. I do apologize that beyond the initial moment of joy where we all shared with each other at the start, this has been a conversation from the stage, but we had so much material we wanted to go through uh, to give you a flavor of the thinking behind what's coming up. The sessions, I think, will all be much more interactive uh, along the track as it, as it goes along. But I'm going to start with you, Santiago. What, what, the, what are your answers to those two questions? Mm -hmm. um, so to your second question, I, I think uh, probably the room will be over flooded, but I would go with, the, with the, uh, Nathalie's uh, sort of reverse shark tank. I think that would be, it's, it's going to be a, a, fun, um, a fun discussion. Um, to your first question, in terms of what questions to ask, I, that's a tough one, but I really think it's that depending where you're coming from. You know, if, if you're an entrepreneur, it really depends on sort of trying to answer what are the different types of fundings that you are. If you are an investor, it's, I guess, you know, it's, it's more in terms of um, what kind of capital you have and can provide and, you know, try to sort of to find those, those specific entrepreneurs. But it really depends on what, what side of the table you are. Eliza? Yeah, in terms of, I'll start doing the same order. Um, I also recommend the reverse Shark Tank, but I, uh, I am excited about the conversation on blended finance structures that's happening tomorrow. It's highlighting the work of a great organization called Pursuit uh, in New York City, which is doing really transformational workforce development um, training and has brought some really interesting partners around the table to finance that. So I'll give a pitch for that one. Um, the question I think that's on my mind is really hearing from, getting to the point that Santiago made a few minutes ago, but really hearing from funders and LPs how they are willing to, um, you know, meaningfully advance this this power transfer in this space. I think understanding um, the objectives and the agenda of capital allocators who care about these issues will allow those of us practitioners in the room to to build and shape projects and products that will, um, you know, that will capitalize on what's available. Um, hopefully, doing that all in partnership. But that's a big question on my mind: is where is the appetite and um, and the, the key goals for, for funders right now. Great, I'll give the last word to you, Natalie. I would have to agree. Everyone should go see the reverse Shark Tank one. <laughs> <laughs> and just cross your fingers that people aren't nice. If you've got the VC pitching against the debt, pitching against the revenue finance, and everybody's really nice, then it's boring. But so no let's, one's allowed to. Let's hope everybody comes in with like, <laughs> yeah, that killer instinct, Thank right? You. And they all fight for you know competing which one's the better form of finance. Um, but I would say that the question that I want to explore both myself and that I would invite others to is, is we need to unpack risk, how we have historically defined risk, what and who we've decided is risky. I think that that is ripe. I think that the models that have been constructed until now um, have largely been um, informed by some form of, of easy, easy yeah. sort of, like what's easy, what's proximate, uh, what looks like me, what is familiar to me. And I think that we have a huge opportunity both to create uh, multi-generational wealth for people and communities that haven't seen that, um, and also um, to be great fiduciaries for those of us that are responsible for sums of money by reimagining what risk looks like and maybe um, re-examining what biases, not just biases, but what you know practices are leading to some old forms of risk that just have to be retired.